A very good morning once again, and a very good afternoon to our friends joining from the Mekong region. Uh, we would start with the first session on uh, shared culture and heritage. There's been a slight change in today's program as Dr. Anirban Ganguly had to leave town due to some work. He has requested uh, Dr. Prabhide to kindly chair and moderate the session. Uh, before I hand over the session to Dr. Day, just some house rules in order to ensure smooth functioning of uh, the session. I request all the speakers and panelists to kindly uh, mute themselves when not speaking. And in case you're facing connectivity issues, you may switch off your camera and continue in the audio mode. And the audience member can uh, raise a question by signing in and uh, uh, accepting the terms and uh, conditions. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tantanjim, and welcome back to the first uh, walking session uh, in this International Conference of 20 Years of Mekong Gonga Cooperation. We had an excellent uh, beginning uh, in the inaugural in the session, very rich presentation, speeches by Secretary East, uh, DG ICW, and Chairman uh, RIS. And the common point which I can make out of, out of the three excellent morning uh, speeches is that each and every one emphasized on the culture and civilization linkages. And that's what the MGC started. 20 years back you know, with the soft power, with this cultural relations, civilization and linkages. And we've seen uh, DGICW speaking about several incidences in the past, in the recent contemporary period, how the Mekong countries and India together introduced the culture and civilizations in terms of projects like uh, we have with uh, in, in Siem Reap, the museum, uh, archaeological sites, excavations, restorations, so on and so forth. And uh, to discuss uh, cultural and civilization relations, and the session is a shared culture and heritage. And I have the pleasure to invite four speakers. They are eminent and authors, uh, commentators by their own right. Uh, we, from India, we have Professor Parul Pandyadar. She is teaching. Uh, Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art History at the Delhi University, and then Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan, uh, Director of Ms. Ms. Niharika Gupta, who is heading uh, research at the SAP area. From Mekong, we have Dr. Sofana Srichampa. She is the chair of Center for Bharat Studies at Mahidol University. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sofana. And then Dr. Piyanath Stoikam is a lecturer, politics and international relations, Ubun. Rajatani University in Thailand. Dr. Pianath, I was talking about before the session started, you know, he was one of the recipients for MGC scholarship sometime. So, so we have a very uh, rich panel here and looking forward to hear from them. As a doctor, you know, uh, Dr. Tanjam said that uh, the, the rule is that 15 minutes. And so maybe, uh, you know, if you have any PowerPoint, you can use it. Otherwise, 15 minutes time uh, we devote to you. So with that uh, introduction, very briefly, my job will be the timekeeper. So I, I, you know, I will remind you once the 15 minutes lapse and uh, and then, you know, uh, let's see the first round and the second round, maybe when we have Q&A after the four speakers and then we will pick up questions, then you will have some time to, you know, again, to speak and share your thoughts. So thank you very much. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Arul Pandya Dhar, um, Delhi University. The floor is yours, uh, Professor Dhar. You have to unmute. Un unmute. Yes. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah. 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 Can hear you. Thank you very much, Professor Prabhide. Uh, and many, many thanks to uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs and the ASEAN India Center at the Research and Information Systems. Uh, for inviting me to this important conference. Uh, my talk discusses the interplay of history and memory in shaping cultural contacts between India, Vietnam and Cambodia in the Mekong heartland. I also address possibilities of continued cultural engagements from the deep histories of these interactions. By looking at critical trends and shifts in the nature of interactions, I address some key questions. What do historical sources tell us about early contacts between India and the Mekong region? 
what can we learn about the ways in which these contacts developed, changed and were remembered over time? And finally, how does the connected past of these countries help in conceptualizing contemporary cultural relationships between India and the Mekong region? Now, we encounter a term Funan in Chinese historical records such as the Liangshu and others, which was a generic name given to a cluster of multiple and competing polities along the Mekong Delta and the coast. Indian presence in Funan has been well established from early centuries of the first millennium. Inscriptions mention a Brahmin named Kondinya who arrived in Funan either directly from India, scholars differ in this, or from Malaysia or the southern islands. He is said to have married the ruling local princess Nagi Soma, Liu Ye in the Chinese records. This legend found in 7th century inscriptions from both Champa and ancient Cambodia and in related versions since the 3rd century in Chinese records provides for a dual ancestry which is local Southeast Asian and Indian in the legitimation of early Khmer as well as Cham kings of Cambodia and Vietnam. Inscriptions from this period onwards alongside art and architectural remains are the richest source of information about the nature of connections. Among the earlier inscriptions, perhaps one of the most important is the Okan inscription found from a site called Nachang, which was a port located on the maritime trade route from India to northern Vietnam and southern China. Coming to archaeological excavations, the earliest archaeological excavations in the Mekong Delta region were led by the French archaeologist Louis Malere in Okio in the 1940s. More sites and finds were revealed in later excavations such as those by the German Archaeological Institute since 1994 and the Lower Mekong Archaeological Project initiated by the University of Hawaii in 1996. At present, the continued engagement of Vietnamese archaeologists have revealed a multicultural Mekong Delta region linked with China, India and in an intra-Southeast Asian context and has yielded rich material remains of cross-cultural trade and settlements. The archaeology of trade becomes very important here. Hindu Buddhist sculptures, pottery, ceramics and more. These developments have pushed back the antiquity of India's links with the Mekong Delta appreciably and are matched by an increasing awareness of the early onset of localization of Indic elements on the substratum of ancient Southeast Asian cultures. Now from about the 7th century, Poonan declined in importance and a new kingdom by the name Chendla appears in the records. Identified as Ishanapura northwards from Funan, where the ancient Khmer's constructed Hindu temples, which were inscribed with ins uh, stone steles, and these then tell us a lot about the nature of Khmer political and cultural identity. The 7th and 8th centuries in ancient Cambodia are referred as the pre Angkorian period, and sites such as Ashram Maharsi. Kunumda, Kulen, Angkor Bore, Sambor on Mekong and Sambor Krikuk from this period have yielded rich localized remains. In ancient Champa in central Vietnam, the earliest surviving substantial monumental remains belong to about the 7th century. The most famous centers include Mizon, Chakyu and Dongzong in the Chubon Valley, coastal Nachang, Po Nagar Temple Complex, Phan Rang, Hua Lai, and Phu Hai, among others. India's sacred geography, its mythical mountains, the Meru and Kailash, rivers Ganga and Mahanadi, epic and Buddhist narratives, continued to find an important presence in the art and epigraphy of the region. The idea of India was retained in the memory and translocation of its sacred geography 
its religions and ritual par paraphernalia, but these were completely integrated within distinct localized cultural identities. Now, with the shift of the Khmer capital to Angkor from the 9th century, temple mountains continued to be built on artificially stepped terraces in the image of the mythical Meru. Angkorian rulers assimilated religious cosmography and rituals of kingship within local Khmer beliefs of ancestor worship and mountain spirits and the more mundane needs for water management. The renowned Angkor Wat was conceived as a temple mountain dedicated to Lord Vishnu and was also at the same time a memorial to its patron king, Surya Varman II. The next powerful ruler, Jaya Varman VII, adopted Mahayana Buddhism as the state religion and built the grand Bayon in his city of Angkor Thom. Now, after the death of Jayavarman VII, the neighboring kingdoms of northern Thailand and the Thai principalities in the south grew powerful. Angkor's control over regions like Sukhothai and Lago was lost, and Angkor declined in political power but not in religious significance. Indian influence survived in the royal ritual paraphernalia of kings and Brahmins and in the collective memory of its sacred geography. But regular contacts by way of trade and political embassies with India appear to have receded as per the historical records available. Chinese, Thai, Cham and Sri Lankan contacts on the other hand, by way of pilgrimage, visits, envoys and traders and settlers are well attested. Given the long history of contact between pre-modern Cambodia and India, one may wonder how the glory of Angkor and its Khmer kings could have eluded notice in medieval India by its absence in the historical records. It is in this context that a lone mention of the gift of a war chariot by a Kamboj king to the Chola king in the early 11th century Karandai copper plate inscriptions of Rajendra Chola I becomes important. Now, meanwhile, by the 13th century, Angkor Wat began to be revisited as a place of Buddhist worship. It had changed in character. As Thai control over Angkor grew, Khmer aesthetics began to influence Thai royal architecture and literature, and that is by the 17th century. The Bangkok Palace, for example, has an impressive model of Angkor Wat placed prominently commissioned by its Buddhist Thai monarch, Rama IV, in the mid-19th century. Now, finally, coming to my last rubric, which is on modernity and the connected past, Indian awareness about its ancient ties with Mekong and other Southeast Asian nations witnessed a renaissance towards the late 19th, early 20th century. At the threshold of India's freedom from the British, this awakening was both opportune and reassuring for a nation struggling to free itself from British colonial rule. Modernity and the changing geopolitical order brought with it radically different systems of governance and expectedly fractured relationships with past forms of transcultural intra-Asian connections. Cultural values grew distanced from the more immediate and dominant economic and political interests. During the mid-20th century, Cambodian modernism in art and architecture had a brief but promising spell. But the mid to the last quarter of the 20th century progressively saw Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia suffer immense political strife and destruction on account of a changing geopolitical order order and power struggles with the Vietnam-American War 1955 to 75 and the Khmer Rouge takeover in Cambodia between 1975 and 79. Consequent to the widespread devastation in Cambodia, the Indian government, upon the request of the People's Republic of Kampuchea, undertook the conservation of the 12th century Angkor Wat Temple between 1986 and 1992 as a gesture of goodwill, diplomacy, and the memory of shared cultural values. 
This was a time when Western nations had refused to engage with successive Cambodian governments. But when the UN intervention happened in 1992 or 93, soon after, Western nations overtook the process and Indian efforts were criticized and even pushed into oblivion. More recently, the Archaeological Survey of India has conserved the Takram, another exceptional monument in the Angkor region, and has also periodically been engaged with conservation efforts at the Vatpu in Laos, the Ananda complex in Bagan, and Misen in uh, Vietnam. To conclude, the changing nature of India's contacts with Mekong suggests a continuous reimagining and not a fossilizing of its connections at different junctures in history. History informs contemporary practices and suggests the need for rethinking India's relationships with Cambodia and Vietnam in the context of the present international order. Cultural values need to be more and more linked with education goals, mobilities of people, developmental objectives, and the sharing of expert know-how and technologies of cultural interpretation to enable the strength of a connected past to enter into productive collaborations in the future and not remain embedded in memories. As countries that also share histories of colonization, collaboratives can be formed to raise common concerns such as heritage repatriation, theft of antiquities, etc. in international forums. Documentation, archiving, and the use of digital media in spreading cultural awareness and sharing traditional knowledge systems can be effective tools in building cultural bridges. The role of electronic media needs to be exploited. The newly developing trilateral highway and other networks have immense potential in bringing economic and cultural objectives together by increasing connectivity. Tourism, culture and education should not be mutually exclusive objectives but need to be brought together in innovative ways in consultation with subject experts. Museological and conservation practices can act as building bridges between the Mekong Ganga countries and professionals in the fields of art history, archaeology, museums, history, and heritage conservation transnationally so that initiatives can be taken further. It is certainly heartening that some of these initiatives are already being debated and given shape as, for example, the creation of a common archival resource center at the Nalanda University, the MGC Textile Museum, and the training of heritage professionals, which are already part of the plan of action for the next 10 years. And finally, I would like to emphasize that culture should not be separated from trade and diplomacy initiatives at all, History and the contemporary world is full of examples that cultural knowledge is also power and a very potent force to also further trade and political motives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Padul Panti for excellent presentation. And you are perfectly on time. You know, in fact, you have finished uh, you know, in 14 minutes. So thank you very much. And also what I found and, and uh, uh, you know, at the end, uh, you also give a series of recommendations. That's very nice for the foreign office to take, you know, pick up those. And uh, and the, your statement, culture should not be looked separately than trade and diplomacy. That's also interesting. In fact, in MGC and as the DGICWA, you know, he said in the morning, and we know it, well documented that the MGC Foundation is basically the, one of the prominent drivers uh, is uh, culture and uh, civilization relations between Mekong countries and India. So we had excellent opening uh, from you uh, and reminding us and your paper itself it talks about the history of memory of contacts with India in the Mekong heartland. So and this is very right, very apt 
uh, presentation in the paper. And thank you once again for presenting thank within the time. We will come back again, you know, if there are questions to you, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, then in the Q and a time. So we move on, and the second uh, presentation will be from Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan and uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Niharika Gupta from SAP area. So floor is uh, to Dr. Sudha and uh, Ms. Niharika. So also to you, 10 to 15 minutes time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation for the ICWA AIC conference on 20 years of Mekong Ganga Cooperation. Actually, Professor Parul Pandya has spoke very effectively about the importance of archaeology, inscriptions, travel such as pilgrimage, and deciphering a kind of shared heritage between India and Southeast Asia. And also the recommendations are very, very pertinent, I would like to say. Uh, Niharika Gupta, my colleague and my young friend, and I are presenting a paper together on transmission of textual culture, how the text has also influenced this kind of sharing and bonding between these cultural regions. So our paper has two parts. The first part where we speak, I br it briefly examines how texts and their dissemination played a large role in the cultural development of South and Southeast Asia from the ancient to pre-modern times and how such a culture became the bedrock of a shared heritage in the region. In the second part, Niharika will talk about how during the present age of advances in digital technologies, there are new opportunities for revitalization of this vast shared heritage through open ways of collaboration. So coming to my, my part of the paper, the recognition that heritage is simultaneously a gift and a responsibility is particularly resonant for studies of South and Southeast Asia because the creation of this shared heritage was through both individual enterprise and social innovation on a scale difficult to imagine at this time and also because it invites us to reimagine our cultural relations today. Much exciting work has gone ahead by scholars across disciplines on how local and regional cultures drew from one another and contributed to our understanding of how practices, literatures and religions evolved over time. So now, starting at the start, the story goes back to how trade opened pathways for the creation of imaginative and creative complexes across South and Southeast Asia where, that were linked to one another through a series of networks and also one of the, perhaps one of the most fascinating stories of the ancient and medieval world. So our vision of the Mekong Ganga Cooperation draws inspiration from two insights arising from scholarly studies since the 1990s. One, that we will best understand this web of connections through a bifocal gaze that keeps in view simultaneously the regional scale of interaction and mutual influence and the local levels at which ideas, artistic expressions and ritual practices were reinvented and developed. The second acknowledges the role of the physical environment in shaping conduits of interaction. For example, the maritime Asia, monsoon Asia, are seen pivotal to cultural flows in this sense. Against this background, we offer an overview of how cultures of Cambodia, India, Lao, PDR, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam have interacted historically. One can see multi-directional flows active in the ancient and medieval world, focusing on the transmission of textual cultures through the travels of priests, pilgrims, and manuscripts. Examples from Angkor, for example, the courts of Ava, Ayutthaya, and of Arakan show how different phases of history led to the crystallization of distinct textual influences with associated community identities. Serving to connect far-flung regions or forming a cosmopolitan trading centers, these cultures traverse linguistic, ethnic, and political borders. So then I'll give a kind of a history. I don't know whether we have that much of time for that. The earliest settlements in the Mekong Delta dating back to 2000 BC, urban settlements that happened later, and the competition over trade, settling, settling in processes towards dissemination of technologies, complex knowledge and cultural trades, and how during the first millennium CE starts the start emerging on the Malay Peninsula, the rise of states, development of navigational techniques and widespread use of writing systems are all meant that in the first millennium 
the movement of knowledge and expressive forms was accelerated and manifest itself powerfully across these regions. So some of the uh, key agents in this process were religious professionals as evangelists or those in the quest of knowledge. While these texts were at first primarily transmitted orally, residing in the heads of monks who had gone to outlying areas, they were later transmitted in manuscript form and converted into a living practice of religious communities in a variety of ways beyond the, their obvious function as supports of the world of texts. So noting that Khmer starts being used for inscriptions at the same time as Sanskrit, Professor Sheldon Pollock had, had commented on the fact that even Khmer was likely to have been the language of day-to-day -day administration, Sanskrit was exclusively used for prashasti or sophisticated praise poetry of rulers. The prashasti poetry testifies both to, to rulers' investment in their public image and to members of the Angkor court having mastered Sanskrit philology, mythography, scientific literature, and the poetic canon. So the two points emerge from these studies of Khmer culture. First is that texts of scripture, literature, and architecture were significant vehicles of cross-cultural communication, but also that taken themselves, they offer an incomplete picture. To trace the expansion and development of Buddhism, we have to look at where relics and stupas traveled, how mantras were interpreted in ritual context, for example, and more work perhaps need to be done on the travel of oral and performative traditions between South India and Southeast Asia. This has implications not just for recovering the ties that linked us uh, uh, in the past, but also for deepening connections today through collaborations between museums and exchange programs in the performing arts. During the medieval period, uh, the consolidation of Pali Buddhist literature and the early modern Bangla, for example, is seen to mediate between classical, cosmopolitan, and local lit literatures in Arakan. The poetic forms, grammar, orthography of Sanskrit were preserved immaculately in the Prashastis, but there is also another evidence of literary composition in Sanskrit, not indeed of any in Khmer until 1701. In Thailand, how Sanskrit manuscripts became not only a minuscule fraction of those extant Sanskrit texts, also texts like, for example, the Vagbhatas, um, the Kavya Lankara, the Nalopa Akhyana, Natya Shastra, Bharatas Natya Shastra, and needless to say, Ramayana, Mahabharata, all these were translated, transcreated, interpreted into the different languages and the different cultural zones. So uh, there is also um, uh, court Brahmins use Sanskrit for rituals and divination. And this literature was also used much for Niti literature. And so, so it's different, not just as a literature, but different kinds of sciences, uh, different kinds of knowledge also communicated with each other during this time. And apart from Sanskrit, Pali also was a vehicle for disseminating translocal myths that served to link places, myth and uh, both mythic and actual. It is not a, a surprise that we have a Kurukshetra in the Khmer country and also in North India. So the, the, all these, you know, uh, under, underscore the exchange that happened between these two cultures. A shift occurs in the 13th century when Buddhism establishments were destroyed in India and Bagan, the capital of Burma, became the refuge of Buddhists from the subcontinent and from Angkor and make, marking a new phase in cross-cultural interactions. And texts were very central again to the creation of a Buddhist ecosystem around the Bay of Bengal with Burma, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Cambodia, seeking to preserve religion through a program of institutional reform and scholarly systematization. So these Buddhist reforms dominated the imagination of Islamic and Christian world during the 15th and 16th centuries, observing that money and such mental constructs as millenarism both represent a phenomena of global dimensions, but with quite different local manifestations, as said by histo historian Sanjay Subramaniam. He, he, he describes how the kingdom of Arakan in Burma engaged with different constituencies across Asia. There is this poet, uh, Alayol, who wrote Bangla poetry with Sufi themes, where his patrons being Muslims employed by the royal administration, who were also involved in the long-distance trade in the Bay of Bengal network. 
So the dynamics of global and local in the work of one author inhabiting such an interstitial position suggests that studies of cultural connections may be most fruitful as at such border zones also. So coming to this, I mean, now I leave it to Niharika to talk about what could be done to collaborate for safeguarding and disseminating and providing a better access to this shared heritage of texts and, you know, and uh, written knowledge as also oral knowledge. Thank you so much. Over to Niharika. Mute, you're mute. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Gopalakrishnan, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So following this historical survey, we propose directions for the future, building on institutional measures that have already been initiated. So the power of the digital medium to expand access and to enable collaborative research and curation has been emphasized at earlier MGC conferences. And this has led to initiatives like opening the Asian Traditional Textile Museum and setting up the Common Archival Resource Center at Nalanda, as well as projects to map inscriptions, create do documentaries, and initiate, initiate courses on our shared heritage. All these have built strong foundations on which we propose developments in digital humanities may be integrated into research, higher education, and public dissemination. So we would like to emphasize that the digital does not only facilitate access and collaboration, it opens up new frontiers in analyzing texts, artistic styles, and relationships across time and space. There are now open source tools that we can apply to map centers of learning and study the role of religious networks and the interaction between local and cosmopolitan spheres of literary activity to list some of the areas that scholars have identified for further research. This is an area where Sahapedia can contribute. Having built an open digital encyclopedic resource on the arts, cultures, and histories of South Asia over the last decade, we have this year entered a partnership with the National Institute of Advanced Study, Bangalore, on a digital humanities program. Our endeavor is to apply machine learning, artificial intelligence, and visualization tools to find new ways of representing, interpreting, and finding connections between data. What also distinguishes digital humanities projects is that they communicate effectively with the public. But for them to achieve greatest impact calls for sustained collaboration between libraries and museums on digitizing and sharing information on collections. As a reference point, the European Union has initiated the Time Machine project through which infrastructure is being built to digitize large volumes of information from historical archives, museums and library collections, and geohistorical data sets. Given the scale of textual heritage in South and Southeast Asia, there is still much to be studied, which requires collaboration between scholars working in different languages and from across disciplines. This would mean raising resources to support large-scale research projects, for instance, last year, a synergy grant from the European Research Council made possible the launch of the Dharma project on the religious making of South and Southeast Asia. Under this, task forces on different regions from South India to Bengal Arakan to Cambodia are looking at epigraphic, paleographic and archaeological sources. A long-term measure to facilitate uh, research, such research would be to have corpuses of texts put online. This would give us much larger data sets for textual analysis, making it possible to trace how concepts, works, and characters are interpreted by different writers. Similar analysis may be applied to artifacts, artworks, and architecture. Data may be viewed on two scales, simultaneously or in succession, so that we can combine micro-analysis of local material culture and economies and macro-analysis of translocal influences and global trends. A digital repository integrating such tools would serve scholarship and also contribute to deepening public engagement with our shared culture. So this is just an outline of how digital humanities can contribute to the areas listed in the vision for Mekong Gal Ganga cultural fusion, education, tourism, networks between media, archives, museums, joint research programs and public awareness, which we hope will feed into our ongoing conversations. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, 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 Krishna and 
Niharika Gupta uh, for excellent presentation. And um, uh, we, I think uh, there are some questions uh, on your paper, and I will come back to that maybe after others that present their papers. So thank you once again uh, for a detailed presentation uh, on uh, Seattle culture and heritage. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Sufana uh, from Mahidol University to present uh, her paper. Dr. Uh, Sufana, please, floor is yours. Are you there? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, Thai time. Yes. First of all, yes. <laughs> I would like to thank Professor Prabir, AIC and RIS for inviting me to join this uh, conference. Uh, I would like to present a paper on civilizational aspects of Mekong Ganga cooperation from past to post COVID-19. India and Southeast Asia have had long relations since ancient times, like uh, two, three professor already mentioned. According to the historical linkages between Ganga and Mekong countries, some aspects of shared cultural heritage among MTC <coughs> members from past to post COVID-19 are presented uh, here based on some cooperative framework of the MTC. Uh, I would like to focus the first one on education and tourism. According to the Hindu philosophy and ancient knowledge transmitted to the current generation in India and the world, several ideas are proposed for further Mekong Ganga cooperation as follows. The first one is yoga. One of the shared heritages India has shared with the world is yoga, recognized by the UN as International Yoga Day on the 21st June since 2014. Popularity of yoga in the uh, Mekong region. In the Mekong countries, yoga is starting to become popular. If we search yoga websites in this country, yoga is a niche product, commanding high prices for private offline online courses. As there are few experts in this field in this region, the wellness industry targets those who can afford the high prices. However, yoga also realistically functions as an aspect of cultural diplomacy, linking the Ganga and Mekong regions in terms of education and tourism. Education on yoga, the government of India promotes both training courses and degree courses on yoga to the world, including Mekong countries. The, uh, the more local Mekong people learn yoga directly from certified academic institutions in India the more likely it will be that the pure essence of yoga knowledge will be taught correctly to the local people. Mekong people can then trans transfer this yoga correctly to others so that yoga practice can spread widely among the community and the cost of trainings can be brought down. They can serve as skilled yoga teachers and trainers for their uh, people. Consortium of Yoga Mekong, oh, sorry, Consortium of Ganga Mekong Yoga. If MTC highlighted more cooperation based on yoga activities, it would strengthen the quality and popularity of yoga in this region. The following are suggestions to achieve this. The first one, Mekong uh, Ganga Yoga Competition. Competitors could be youth or adults formed into specific teams. India could host the first competition in India to determine the Indian yoga competition. This will inspire Mekong teams and others to get involved and develop their teams. Once established, each country would take turns to host the competition annually. The second idea is Mekong Ganga Yoga Standardization. The government and the yoga academic institutions in India should collaborate with the local Mekong yoga scholars and institutions ensure the quality of yoga at various levels by testing and certification. If the testee fails to meet specified standards, further trainings and teachings should be offered and followed by a retest. After being certified by the designated local academic institution, this can be used for job applications in this field and for advanced 
study on yoga in India. Another outstanding and well-known science of India along with yoga is Ayurveda. Ayurveda is less well-known in the Mekong region than yoga. Despite the Mekong countries know that Ayurvedic medicines and products from India are effective and exported to the world. Moreover, traditional medicine like Thai traditional medicine had been influenced by Ayurvedic knowledge, but the knowledge has failed to be brought up to date. If there is bilateral cooperation for a project on translation of Ayurvedic Sanskrit text into Thai, or sharing Ayurvedic knowledge with the local traditional medicine practitioners. This will help us strengthen the traditional health and well-being systems and ensure health security in the region. Moreover, study tours on Ayurveda in India for medical, medical health policy makers will raise awareness and allow Ayurvedic knowledge and products to become available in the region. If the Ayurvedic Ganga can be introduced to Mekong traditional medicine, it would support alternative therapies and care for locals at a cost that is affordable for patients in need. It will help the health security of the region. A Mekong uh, Ganga Yoga and Ayurveda Consortium should be set up after concrete collaborations have been established to ensure progressive outcomes. Yoga and Ayurveda therapy and treatment in India can be promoted as wellness tourism, including historical tourism related to temples of Shiva. Traditional well-being and spas in Mekong countries could be included as part of wellness tourism among Mekong countries, attracting tourists from India and beyond post-COVID-19. Another shared heritage is Ramayana. I will present Ramayana in the modernity of the Mekong region, uh, especially Thailand. In Thailand, the Ramayana is referred to as the Ramakian. The Ramakian is an invaluable part of Thailand's cultural capital, and its literature is studied in schools and as a subject at university level. Moreover, it is regarded as an aspect of Thai identity. The most popular character of the Thai Ramakian is Ravana, or we say Tosakan, who is a great giant represented in various art forms and creative popular culture, such as the Thai animation film, Thai dolls, Thai drama, Thai publications on Ramakian in the verse and prose forms, Thai souvenirs adapted from the Ramkian, etc. It would serve as an ideal exhibition theme, possibly entitled Mekong Ganga Creative Economy from Ramayana, which talks and stores displaying and selling related products. This event could be held in parallel with the regular conferences concerning the Ramayana. Another topic uh, I would like to present, present about the rice culture. The people of Mekko members, as well as most of India, are predominantly rice consumption. Some Mekko countries inherited Indian traditions related to rice, such as the Royal Puffing Day in Thailand and Cambodia, that features the participation of Brahmin in rites related to rice cultivation. Mekong and Ganga have yet to cooperate on an organic rice consortium and continue to compete among themselves and with other countries. If we consider rice as just a commodity, it is rather difficult to cooperate and share on a T2G basis. But if we consider rice as a culture, there are many aspects related to rice culture that can be shared and learned from each other, such as one, collections of local wisdom of underground water preservations, two, young farmer exchange programs as part of Mekong Ganga cooperation, three, online Mekong Ganga grain market, and four, MGC food festival for, for rice products. So I would like to conclude that 
post COVID-19, the challenges for Mekko Ganga regions is to strengthen regionalism rather than globalization. Mm -hmm. Although the Mekko Ganga cooperation projects are still small scales, the peoples of the region have new opportunities to learn and know each other better than before COVID-19. That gives us reason to be hopeful thereafter as the decade progresses. With common focus, determination, and fervor, the Mekong Ganga Corporation has the potential to offer limitless opportunities that will better the lives of the peoples and communities involved. Beyond that, if structured to be sustainable, the benefits and delights will surely extend through generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sofana an excellent paper. Um, you talked about uh, connecting uh, the Mekong-Gonga cooperation countries uh, very nicely. And also, I found that you given us recommendations, civilization aspects of MGC from past to post-COVID-19. To use the word post-COVID-19, so, so many, many important, <laughs> many important, you know, recommendations as well. On, and I'm sure that you know these will be taken up, and uh, some of course should be implemented. You know, it's my personal view again. So thank you uh, for the presentation, the paper. Now uh, the last speaker in the session is Dr. Pianath. Uh, so Dr. Pianath, we are on time, and you have also you know 15 minutes. So over to you uh, uh, for the, your presentations. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pravide, and uh, thank you very much, Indian Council for World Affairs and uh, AI uh, in ASEAN, Indian Center at RAS. Uh, my presentation uh, title, The 20 Years of Mekong Kanka Cooperation, the Initiative for Shared Culture and Heritage. Uh, the Mekong Kanka Cooperation, I think uh, everyone knows that it's an initiative for regional cooperation that uh, aims at developing closer relationship and better understanding between India and the Mekong region, which uh, start from uh, 2000, where the Minister of Sikh Country uh, coming together and make decision uh, to develop uh, mainly informed areas, uh, as uh, other speaker already mentioned, tourism, culture, education, and transport network. Uh, the cooperation framework was then adopted by the member to encourage and facilitate the implementation of respective programs. And to achieve the given framework, MGC adopted institutional arrangement to affirm and review its progress. And the latest, which is the 10 ministerial meeting in Bangkok in 2019, uh, in order to commemorate 20 years of MGC establishment, this paper aimed at uh, signifying MGC achievement in cultural spheres. Uh, the paper agreed that MGC or Mekong Kanka Cooperation strategically emphasized strong civilization and cultural connectivity between India and the Mekong region. So uh, to compare with other four aspects of MGC cooperation, Cultural uh, cooperation is far, is far greater than other aspects. Uh, for further clarification, uh, firstly, I will explain the basic fundamental of shared culture and heritage between the two regions. And after that, I will highlight key programs that are defining the shared culture uh, following the MGC. Uh, firstly, let me talk about the Mekong Ganga in terms of shared culture. As we know that uh, this multilateral platform does not only draw on the belief in multipolarity or the concept of development, but it embraces a focus on normative interaction between states, especially the significance of shared civilization, arts and heritage. So MGC entails a focus on common traditions and cultural values. Therefore, the idea of civilization connectivity results in naming this sub-regional uh, cooperation after the two important rivers, which is the Meko, uh, which are the Mekong and the Ganga. Uh, as scholarship affirms, I uh, maybe uh, summarize there are four key cultural fundamentals 
To begin with the Chair culture, the Indian and Mekko region has long been culturally connected as Indian bringing along Indian merchant and sailor introduced uh, to the native of Southeast Asia, the exchange of arts and cultures. Uh, this cultural context resulting in the cultural similarities in tradition, custom, folklore, and festival. The second element is the Chair archaeology. They are archaeological building influenced by Indian civilization in various places of the Mekong region, for example, Mizun in Vietnam, Angkor, Sukho Thai or Bakan in Myanmar or Wat Phu in Laos. The similarities in architectural heritage, uh, architect, archaeological remains uh, can be recognized as a shared civilization between India and Southeast Asia. The third element is the shared language and literature. I think uh, we have learned that the Mekong and India benefit from uh, the uh, each other connectivity through language, for, for example, Sanskrit and Pali, and also Ramayana, as mentioned by other speakers. Uh, the fourth share uh, element is the uh, chair religions that uh, become another important foundation. Uh, both Hinduism and Buddhism uh, were initially synthesized with the local culture, and right now, undoubtedly, uh, uh, Buddhism become a strong connection between uh, Mekong and Ganga civilization of connectivity. And as Professor Sopana has mentioned, we have the similarly culture in terms of base of life. We have a, a food, bright profession, and the two regions share similarity in terms of water culture, fishery, agriculture, ethnicity, and religion. Uh, building upon the chair culture as heritage, the MGC has a massive potential to deploy and strengthen their cultural cooperation. And I can uh, summarize that for two decades, since uh, 2000 to 2020, uh, its success and its achievement could be seen in six ways. Firstly, uh, networking of scholar and expert and information. Uh, India and the Mekong benefit from its cultural connectivity and uh, MGC supports ac uh, academic activities to enhance uh, networking of scholar. For example, conducting research on culture and cultural uh, uh, databases. In terms of research, uh, Indian government support the study of Buddhist and Tripathic studies at the University of Pune and also archaeological research and academic activity. Also, uh, there are MOU or Memorandum of Understanding between India and National Museum uh, in Vietnam. And recently, uh, there are two projects uh, to map the Chair historical and civilizational linkage. Uh, one is the Sailing to Swanapum project and another project is mapping of instructions a uh, mapping of inscription along the Mekong. The two projects aim to document Indian related inscription and Indian related maritime encounters that uh, Indian and the Mekong region uh, have been contact. For dialogue on culture, there are a number of events organized by the two regions uh, supported by MGC. For example, MGC conference on textile, conference on India arts and Buddhism, and uh, Indian Foundation also organized uh, connecting basin reflection of the Mekong Ganga dialogue. Uh, Thomasad University also organized Ganga Mekong conference. And today, uh, uh, IS also organized a conference on Mekong Ganga cooperation. In addition, uh, MGC also focused on developing material uh, of MGC culture. One of its progress is the establishment of cultural database. Uh, right now, the uh, MGC have agreed to support the Common Archival Resource Center at Nalanda University. The center uh, has collected copies of important historical documents, artwork, and the inertial stage, uh, the center website is in progress. I'm going to show you the uh, Currently, website of the uh, uh, the center, which is under the construction, as you can see from the screen, uh, the Common Archival Resource Center working in progress. Therefore, uh, the MJC minister have reviewed the progress and asked all the uh, 
MTC member to further collaboration uh, to enhance the center as a hub for academic and research on India and Southeast Asia historical and civilizational linkage. Uh, for the second, uh, the second aspect uh, is the cultural festival and cultural exchange to showcase of culture of the Mekko and the Kanka region. MGC support trade fairs and cultural festival program. For example, the Cambodian government organized the River Festival in 2018 to promote ASEAN to reside in the life with the Mekong Ganga Corporation. In addition, last year, uh, the Indian Embassy in Bangkok organized the Northeast Indian Festival uh, to introduce cultural richness of the Northeast region to Southeast Asia. Moreover, India also uh, hosts cultural troops and craftsmen from the Mac home to perform and participate in cultural festival in India. For example, festival in Manipur, festival in Nagaland, and also in other states of India. In terms of Buddhism diplomacy toward Mac home region, uh, to emphasize the religion, uh, relig religious connectivity between the two regions, uh, uh, Buddhist relay souvenir is used as a gift from Indian leaders uh, when they visit to the Mekong country. To be pre precise, Indian leaders, Indian diplomats, officially and official, uh, use Buddha, uh, Buddha li Lilik or uh, Bot Free as a souvenir for presenting to their Mekong counterparts. Uh, in terms of pilgrimage, India facilitates Buddhist pilgrimage for persons from the Mekong region. Uh, India offers special reception to collective groups of pilgrims from the Mekong, for example, from Cambodia, Laos, Miet, uh, Myanmar, and Vietnam, and uh, to join the International Buddhist uh, Conference, which held in Delhi, Varanasi, and Saranat. The new dynamic on Buddhism cooperation is looking forward to develop uh, the Mekong in the Buddhist trail and to enhance tourist cooperation among the MGC countries. Uh, in terms of cultural heritage and conservation and promotion, I think other speakers already mentioned that there are so many archaeological monuments in Mekong and precisely uh, archaeological survey of India together with the Indian Embassy uh, in the Mekong also provide financial assistance and knowledge transfer for archaeological reconstruction in Southeast Asia. And following the MGC plan of action, uh, MGC also aims to promote capacity building in terms of uh, offering training costs for the Mekong staffs in museology conservation technique at uh, National Museum Institute in New Delhi. In terms of the educational and cultural scholarship program, following MGC roadmap, the government of India offer uh, 50 scholarship called Mekong Ganga Corporation Scholarship Scheme for students from the Mekong region to uh, pursue higher education. And the example of the uh, student uh, who received uh, MGC scholarship is myself. Uh, I received uh, MGC a scholarship to study a uh, master degree in political science at Usmani University in Hyderabad uh, in 2011 to 2000. Uh, the team. Moreover, there are 10 scholarships for MGC students to study in course in museology, conservation technique uh, that offer at National Museum in New, New Delhi. Uh, in terms of the uh, traditional textile museum, uh, in 2016, I visited the traditional textile museum in uh, uh, Siem Reap, Cambodia. It's very big building uh, in uh, in Siem Reap. As you can see, I, I already shared the screen. Uh, the big building, which is the traditional textile museum, uh, started uh, and opened in 2014 by the Deputy Prime Minister of Cambodia and the Secretary East of the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. The museum aims to display similarities in ways of life of, along the Mekong and Kanka River. The museum highlights tie dye of yarn or ikat, ikat, which is the uh, textile uh, techniques which widely used by the two regions. And also in uh, right now the in, uh, the textile museum in Siem Reap also bring textile as a traditional and civilizational links for the contemporary usage 
to uplift the economic development uh, in terms of uh, textile industry in the region. Uh, for my conclusion, uh, to encountering the three decades, the coming three decades of co uh, cooperation, I would like to uh, suggest uh, two collaboration that uh, might be another, uh, maybe the, another example of cultural cooperation between the two regions. This paper suggests two activities to enhance. One is the establishment of the Mekong Ganga Study Center and the Memorandum of Understanding between Museum in both region. To begin with, the establishment of Mekong Ganga Study Center would possibly be another step to leverage cultural, cultural and academic cooperation. Uh, MGC uh, and one of the most potential, uh, potential places would be Ubon Rajatani University, Thailand. As you can see from the screen, Ubon Rajatani University or Ubon Rajatani province located at the border, uh, connected to Laos and Cambodia and not far from Vietnam and, uh, along the Mekong River. So this place could be the, and this place, uh, there's so many Indian heritage and civilizational weapon visible in the region. Accordingly, the establishment of the Mekong Kanka Study Center at Ubon Rajatani could uh, maybe uh, uh, helped to strengthen in terms of cultural and uh, economic education uh, cooperation between India and the Mekong. And uh, last month, uh, Ambassador Sujita Durai, Indian Ambassador to Thailand, already visited uh, Ubon Rajatani University. And another a uh, possibility to strengthen Mekong uh, Ganga country relation is the collaboration between museum. Rather than creating new museum, MGC could cultivate and benefit from their shared culture and heritage. Instead of building a separate museum, MGC should promote existing museum and facilitate uh, facilitate them to exhibit civilization of connectivity between the two regions. For illustration, MGC could support the uh, Memorandum of Understanding with Ubon Rajatani uh, National Museum, Thailand. The museum was established to promote local culture and it showcased Indian imprint in the northeastern part of Thailand, especially along the Mekong region. Uh, it uh, includes the history from the Dawarawadi, Jela, and Khmer culture with reference to Hinduism. And one of the interesting uh, Artifacts that I'm showing on the screen is the Atra Narish, uh, Adrana Rishwala, which is a Shiva and Uma Goddess, uh, sandstone sculpture found in, uh, in Ubon Rajatani. The sculpture sit flat cloths, laid position upside low that base. And this is the oldest and only seated, uh, Adrana Rishwala found in Southeast Asia. The museum also uh, display the fam uh, fabrics and textile culture that show similarity between India and the Mekong region. To conclude, uh, MGC could benefit from the civilization of connectivity and for 20 years of our cooperation, we can uh, strengthen more in terms of uh, cooperation on culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Pianat for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I see that you, you also came out with uh, several recommendations uh, for, you know, MGC uh, cooperation on, on, on the cultural side. So with that, uh, we, uh, you know, four speakers and four papers were presented. And, uh, you know, I would uh, request uh, that if you have any questions, you can, you know, in the chat box, uh, I see you no know, questions, but then you know uh, I have questions that I will I will of course add if uh, someone uh, uh, among the panelists if you'd like to have any questions you can you know um, straight away you can raise you can speak uh, you can unmute you can speak uh, and address it to whom you'd like to raise these questions or if you have a short observations or any queries uh, so floor is open. And we have uh, almost about, about 20 minutes time. And uh, so far, the session running on schedule. So if you have any questions, any comments, 
from the participants, from the speakers, please feel free to uh, ask. Can I say something? Yeah, I please. May, yeah, excellent presentations. I mean, so many suggestions came up during this. I think I mean that will all strengthen find the the cooperation between uh, India and Southeast Asia through collaborations, and that is a very important thing that came up in this meeting. And many concrete suggestions also came. From my our part, I suggest that MGC also develop a large digital network, like for example the Europeana, we, uh, uh, you know, something that is a kind of catch-all uh, digital network, so to say. I mean, there is an archival resource center already at Nalanda University. This could be expanded to a much more bigger, larger project in which we could have collaborations, fellowships, exchange programs, and then you know, on specific areas, maybe year-wise. Uh, an area or one aspect. I mean, so many uh, 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 concepts were raised. For example, uh, yoga, Ayurveda, tourism, uh, uh, mapping, Ramayana, uh, rice culture. I mean, crafts and ikat and textiles. Many, many wonderful. Out of this, I mean, after this big bank, maybe we could have a couple of them a year or something, and then give out the uh, uh, fellowships or you know, call for fellowships or any program. So have, have a focused program with with this <laughs> in a more concerted way. And I would like to say that Ramayana, like Professor Sofana was saying, has so many reson resonances not just on uh, Thailand and India alone, but across the, uh, you know, the across the whole region. So I would like to strongly recommend Ramayana as a beginning, not just only as a text, but it's multi multi valences, different lives, different recreations. Crafts, performances, you know, uh, sites. So this could be a beginning, perhaps, and then and one of the beginnings, if everybody thinks it is worth it. And, uh, and then there are, of course, yeah, Ayurveda, yoga. These are all important. But this is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much, and these suggestions very important, very valid. Uh, in fact, in the Ramayana, uh, Dr. Gopalakrishna, you can remember that during the commemorative summit in 2018, we had a couple of events. You know. So all yeah. uh, 10 ASEAN countries, their versions of Ramayana were displayed uh, in Delhi. And then we came out with a commemorative postal stamps for 10 countries. And that was also uh, you know, released right. by all heads of the states, heads of the states of ASEAN and in the prime minister shortly soon after the uh, address in, in the commemorative summit on, I think, on 25th of uh, January in 2018. So these are, but can you tell a little bit about when you said you know, I got the, your points on, on the Raman and I was, of course, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, add it in, in, in the proceedings. When you say the digital network, what exactly precisely you want to say? Is it that digitalization of the archives, documentations or? One is, or right. One is individual digitization of archives and uh, libraries and uh, material, but without connecting them through an open source technology, we are not getting the full benefit of it. We again are in silos and we, how do we be, uh, how how much are we able to cross connect even with them I and digital technologies, open source digital technologies and through a kind of digital humanities, broad based digital humanities project, I think these are very possible now. We could, for example, take some text from each of these regions on a particular topic or on a particular aspect and then study them together. This is how I think a common understanding gets forged. This is what I meant. And is there any template uh, you know, for any other regions, the one uh, you are suggesting in other you know, sub-regions or in other parts of the world so that you know, we can, can study itself and that would right. help us while formulating the project and giving yeah. it to the government, yeah. I am, for example, part of a project from the Jerusalem University on uh, with a funding from the European Research Council on Sans on um, uh, text from uh, from South India. I mean, how they see text from South India. So it is not just Sanskrit, of course, Sanskrit is a very major component, but also the allied. I mean, uh, the regional languages of Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu, and Tamil, and also other languages, and how they see each other in a common framework, and how many. But not just text, but also, yeah, very minutely they go into the aesthetics, the philosophy, the comparative aspects. So I'm thinking of something like the European Research 
council uh, in a fellowship which can in which multi nations can take part and put it together you know rather than one one uh, area or a cultural zone this is what i thank you thank you yes. thank you very much yeah. yes uh, professor uh, parul pandya dar yes yeah. so i wanted to go back to uh, to a very per pertinent point that professor t c a raghavan made in his uh, uh, speech today and uh, he raised a concern about uh, you know that you had actually leading scholars in the field uh, you know r c majumdar nilakantha shastri uh, h v sarkar and others who uh, had made pioneering contributions whatever the shift in historiography uh, there still remains some fundamental contributions by them but post that and post the end of the greater india uh, discourse uh, in the revised historiography of india's india and asean connections we have hardly got any good new scholarship coming from india uh, and that lacune is actually making the world not take us as seriously as we could be taken uh, it's very important uh, unless cultural initiatives of collaborations are informed by a deeper knowledge in the youngsters uh, it is not it is not going to uh, take us very far in fact till today uh you know there is so much happening in the okio excavations it is a rich rich multicultural site uh mizon came much later but at okio in 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 you know in the various connected sites around what is the complex known as punan vietnamese archaeologists are working and uh, constantly on a one to one basis they write so for example alex giang will write to me asking me to interpret certain artifacts that come out from there i think uh, india and uh, vietnam and cambodia have a rich scope to engage in fundamental scholarship that leaves a mark for the future and that's what gets us uh, the recognition that we are serious about our uh, engagements those cultural pasts the way that they reflect in the present uh, till now the catalogs and the exhibitions on india southeast asia connections are happening in europe and the us can we at least start thinking of uh, some digital uh, media you know can we explore digital media to do to bring out the visuality of those connections to reach out to uh, to the to the scholars you know and to the students unless you i have a cambodian student presently uh, who who studying with me and the kind of bonds that are being formed earlier there was a thai uh, student in the in the national museum the, the that those are lasting bonds those have generated uh, a rich academic uh, uh, discourse that can enter into the field of museum conservation so these are just just certain thing the you know the power of that uh, you know sound reliable knowledge on cultural uh, culture and connectivity is required we have a disconnect from the 1950s uh, 60s to this time and it really needs to be bridged thank you uh, thank you excellent intervention you know, i'm sure uh, and dr tc ragavan would like to uh made a comment on it and uh, sir floor is yours you'd like to say something uh, thank you very much uh, dr jay uh, i just wanted to carry forward the point which was made by uh, dr sudha gopala krishnan and then by professor uh, pandey adhar uh, i think these points are very valid and they are often made what often happens is that because they are left uh, unrecorded Uh, the follow up is sometimes weaker than it should be my suggestion uh, would be that if uh, both uh, dr gopala krishnan and uh, uh, professor dhar were to give a very brief note on this which you then incorporate as a part of your recommendations uh, emerging from its uh, from this conference because anything recorded acquires a life and a momentum 
uh, of its own uh, in the government. What is said, uh, you know, is not what the paper is written on, so to say. Correct. Uh, so uh, I would really request Dr. Gopala Krishnan to what she said. It sounded very useful, and to my mind, uh, it sounded doable. Uh, and I think within the framework of projects within the Ganga Mekong uh, uh, platform, uh, it should be found possible to take it forward. We'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Dr. Piyanath, uh, you will be saying something. OK, no, I have a, I have a, a query is that in your presentations you, uh, towards the end, you said that your university would like to host this Mekong Ganga Cultural Center um, and uh, the projects for which, uh, uh, you know, Indian ambassador visited. If you can highlight uh, and the museum on that, you said that there's a network for the, the museums. So are you talking about the network of the museums in, in India with uh, Mekong countries or the network of museums itself in, in the Mekong sub-region? So if you can slightly, because there is some discussion happening, which I know, the network of museums between India and ASEAN context, including mm -hmm. you know, four Mekong countries. So if you can say a little bit more about it. We have a time, you know. Yeah. Uh, for uh, about uh, Bodhra Sata University, my, uh, the university is located at the Mekong, lower Mekong sub-region at the border of Thailand to Laos and Cambodia. And it's just like 100 kilometers to Vietnam. So it's very good point that can connect uh, four countries in the CLMV. Uh, I mean, the lower Mekong sub-region. And in this area, there are so many, I mean, uh, Indian imprints in the regions that uh, scholars from uh, the three Mekong country, also from India, can work together in order to highlight the civilizational connectivity in the area. And the university also aims to be uh, one of the leading university in the lower Mekong sub-region. So we already had uh, uh, our vision uh, to work in the uh, Mekong uh, region. And also when, when the ambassador come to visit uh, to the university, we also learn and know that, I mean, the executive member of the university council also learned that uh, India and the Mekong also having the uh, Mekong Ganga Co uh, Corporation. So I think it's a very uh, good start point that uh, the university can work with the Indian Embassy. And right now, the university preparing the proposal uh, to sub uh, to uh, submit. I mean, in the university level, we are talking to establish the uh, Mekong Ganga Study Center, and we are going to uh, submit the proposal to. Uh, maybe asking for uh, support from the embassy, maybe the Indian Council of World Affairs or Indian Council for Cultural Relations. So we are planning. In terms of the scholars, we also having the uh, group of uh, professors that working on history uh, in terms of archaeology uh, in uh, Mekong region. We have one professor, Professor Siti uh, Chais Mancha, he is the white president of World Takes Time. Uh, he graduated from Shanti Niketa under the Indian Government Scholarship as well there. So he worked on the local textile. So I think there might be the possibility uh, to set up of the Mekong Study Center at the UBU, I mean, Upadrachitan University. In terms of museum, I think actually museum in, in Thailand or in uh, Northeast Thailand or even the Southern Thailand, I think every place in Thailand or the museum in uh, Mekong countries uh, also display the Indian imprints or the civilizational connectivity between India and the Mekong. I think we don't need to to like building a uh, separate museum or a new museum, but we just like highlight on the existing uh, uh, artifacts or sculpture that we have and maybe uh, linking the key important uh, sculpture or the key important maybe stones in each museum in the Mekong region and then we can uh, mapping so that uh, people from both country, uh, from both Mekong and uh, uh, India can, uh, I think, can, can, can learn. And also if they want to travel uh, 
through the civilization or uh, tourism trails. I think it's another uh, aspect of collaboration. So maybe using from the existing museum and the museum collaboration uh, under the MGC. So that, that was my, my, my suggestion. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sofano, please. Yeah, unmute. Uh, unmute. May I uh, share some ideas about yoga and the Eurovet? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mahidon University is also like a medical university. So, we, uh, we are like uh, the leading university in Thailand. And uh, as we are running the Center for Para Studies, and uh, we think that yoga should be promoted widely to public. So our center has started, I think, uh, since the 2014 or 2015, yes, to promote. And finally, we combine with uh, some Eurovedic knowledge. And we uh, offer the uh, post-grad diploma course for 10 months. Uh, we have done uh, for, this is the fourth batch. And uh, this give uh, this like uh, academic service to public. And meanwhile, the Mahidon University also support uh, the uh, CBS Center for Bar Studies at Mahidon to uh, give the train free things on yoga to uh, the community nearby Mahidon. So uh, we try to uh, do our best to promote yoga and Ayurvedic knowledge like uh, the true correct or the correct knowledge from India. So we have some uh, network from India to help in this. So this is the thing that I would like uh, to show you that we do it internationally and uh, some members from uh, at home countries also, also join our course is international course. So this is the thing that I think is has potential to be promoted widely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You also, you know, talked about Mekong Ganga Yoga and Ayurveda Consortium. Yes. Mekong Ganga Yogic and Ayurveda Conference. So, yes. so when you talk about that yoga and Ayurveda Consortium, so if you can elaborate a little more about it, if there is anything that you can give us, you know, you know, just like Dr. Sudha or Dr. Parul Pandya, they will be giving us some note. If you can give us something on that as well. Yeah, I think if uh, in the future, if uh, the uh, Mekong countries have uh, have known more and uh, like uh, have the leading institution or organization in each country, maybe we should collaborate like a consortium. Yeah, between uh, Mekong countries with India. So this will be uh, mm -hmm. uh, will be more powerful to do alone. Yeah, I think it, uh, and it, uh, we, we among ourselves can help India to promote more widely too. And we can share and learn from each other, uh, based on this platform. I think other, other issues too, if it's possible, we should collaborate as a consortium. Yeah, like, uh, I uh, suggested uh, several years ago about rice consortium. It's never happened. But if we, uh, Think of rice as culture, maybe is possible. Yeah, but should be as a consortium. Thank you. Also, to you know, just to remind uh, you that uh, in 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 the Mekongonga Cooperation Plan of Action for 2019 and 2022, which is in effect since last year, at the site line of the 10th MGC Ministerial Meeting, it this came in effect. So there is one, you know, one of the uh, you know, plan of actions is that it talks about the corporate, uh, you know, cooperation in the field of radio and television broadcasting to exchange of content and programs, exchange of personnel for training purposes, sharing of technical expertise and joint production of documentaries that enable promotion of cultural tourism among the MGC countries. So. I would like to know, you know, four of you, you know, if you have you, uh, have you come across any such or you have any plan or you would like to be part of this, uh, you know, 
program which is radio and television broadcasting. So far, I know that India Study Center at Chulalongkorn University, which uh, when Dr. Piyanatha, he he might be knowing, they do some uh, FM broadcasting, you know, uh, on the cultural part. Sometimes, you know, I I I, I get some you know uh, some uh, flyers uh, through the social media. Other than that, anyone, Dr. Sofana or Dr. Dhar or Dr. Gopala Krishnan, um, Niharika, if they, you can highlight what's, you know, your, how it can be, you know, a part of your activities and your contribution. Dr. Sofana? <laughs> I'm thinking how to collaborate. You mean the radio between among us, right? MTC radio. Yeah. Yeah, because right. today, you know, with the digital world, you know, we're more connected and it is almost yeah. you know, easy. You know, it is almost easy you know, to you know, go ahead with a, a radio or a television broadcasting, you know, using the social media and several other platforms. Uh, maybe I go to Dr. Pianath. Uh, you, you raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Actually, I, I, I support the idea of uh, Professor Padi that just mentioned about having like a uh, kind of like radio connection, but I, I think maybe it's not radio, but maybe what, what we think about like podcast, that the online platform that we can uh, using the podcast uh, and then put it uh, as the online database source and then we can uh, uh, mapping all the program, maybe schedule, maybe like once a month we have the Mekong Kanka podcast and today we're talking and next month we're talking. So, uh, and there is no need to like travel to each country, but we can do it online via the uh, uh, podcast or iCloud or I think that's another option. Okay. Yeah, right. I agree. Good, 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 good solutions. Yes. yes, yes. To be online. Yeah. Yes. So know, I, I think, think we, we um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, 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 no. I was just saying that, you know, it would be very useful to have a digital cultural mapping of mm. various aspects raised by Dr. Gopala Krishnan and by uh, Piyanath and Sufana and uh, Niharika. Uh, you know, there's a lot of possibility, including you know, since actual artifacts in many cases are spread across the world, given our colonial histories, whether they are manuscripts, whether they are sculptures, whether they are you know, architectural fragments. We also have stories of heads of sculptures from Donzong sitting in Musee Gime. Now you have the, the body is in uh, Donzong. And, you know, there is a lot of possibility of, uh, you know, exploiting the digital media for bringing mm -hmm. together leaves of manuscripts or actual artifacts and working with a group of researchers. So uh, if COVID-19 has taught us something, really, we've all become experts with digital, you know, digital technology, which a lot of us were resisting. And I think that also opens up a lot of frontiers for using, uh, you know, various methods of cultural mapping and generating cultural knowledge across the Mekong Ganga and other Southeast Asian countries with India. So this is our time really to exploit uh, the loss of uh, the past to the West, which can at least come back for the time being virtually, even while the repatriation crescendo is building. We can at least begin working in the virtual format. Thank you. Before I, uh, uh, okay, Dr. Sofana, please. Uh, additional to Madame, uh, I think that we should promote the virtual museum among MTC. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, from good, there, good. a lot of academic research can also uh, draw from that. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, the more we debate, we get lots of ideas. But we have to stop here because time is up. So I, uh, with that, you know, I thank you all of you for coming up with an excellent papers. You know, despite the difficulties, you could manage time and give us a draft. Uh, going forward, you know, I request uh, all of you to finalize uh, two things here. One is uh, Dr. T C A. Uh, Raghavan, uh, you know. Ambassador Raghavan, he said that, uh, you know, a couple of you know, points, if you can, you know, like a recommendation, if you can give it in sort of an annotated version to us, which will go into the proceedings and maybe we share with uh, other stakeholders. This is one. Second is, uh, please uh, revise your uh, papers and uh, I will send a separate note to you, separate mail to you, 
and and look forward to you know the final versions uh, from your side uh, very soon so that we go for the publications on the time that the ICWA uh, is looking for so with that i thank all of you again and those who are listening to us to youtube or to facebook other social media and here to the blue jeans i thank all of you for joining in the morning in the listening and and a very very interesting session that we had on culture their culture and heritage on mgc and very good afternoon to all of you uh, for joining and uh, i hand over to uh, dr temjin uh, and it is 2:30 in, in delhi and uh, and uh, 2 o'clock in bangkok so uh, dr temjin thank you thank you so thank much. you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you i think we had a very interesting first session in which we got a lot of insight in, on the subject and also a lot of innovative and good recommendation uh and i would uh, on behalf of uh, icwa and eic like to extend our deepest gratitude to all the speakers and the panelists uh for their wonderful insight and also we would like to thank uh, dr prabhide for chairing the session so we would break here for about an hour and we would resume at uh, 1:30 indian standard time for the uh, second session on economic relations we look forward to having you there as well yes thank you thank you thank you, thank you.